very, very good morning and uh, thank you very much for joining us on this Sunday morning. As you know that India and the world faces a huge crisis, a crisis of public health, possibly of survival, which is called the COVID-19 pandemic. But we in India face an even greater crisis, which is the crisis of hunger, the access to food, nutrition. And of course, this is linked to the savings that people have and the earnings that people make and the incomes that they are able to garner in this period. So in this period of lockdown, uh, we have this privilege of talking to Belgian born Indian economist, Mr. Jean Dres, who brings to a strong fundamental analysis, not just an everyday glimpse of life in poverty in the villages, but actual field work and quantitative analysis. John, it's a pleasure to have you in this conversation. And of mm -hmm. course, we've been following your writings very closely over the years, particularly in the last couple of weeks. What do you think will be the impact or what is already the impact of this sudden lockdown on a vast section of the Indian people, vast, vast section of the Indian people? Well, the impact of the lockdown is obviously catastrophic for a very large section of the population, if not a large majority. Uh, as you know, an overwhelming share of the workforce in India belongs to the informal sector. And a lot of these people have lost their jobs overnight. Uh, many of them have probably not even been paid for the work that they've done recently. Uh, many of them are migrant workers who are now unable to go back to their homes and are, and are stranded in cramped conditions uh, all over the country. And uh, there's no likelihood that this is going to get easier anytime soon because it will take a long time for employment to be regenerated, even if the lockdown is eased quite soon, which is far from guaranteed. We are looking at hundreds of millions of people and families in the next few months uh, with virtually no source of livelihood, uh, people who live on the margin to start with, who have very little reserves and who are going to depend to a large extent on various forms of government support for their survival for quite a long time. Uh, what needs to be done? I mean, we have had schemes, some schemes being put into place. We've had cash transfers being announced. Uh, we've had in cities, at least like my city, Mumbai, which is huge, which also depends massively on the migrant worker population, construction labor, all sorts of migrant labor. Somehow or the other, the PDS schemes is not universal. Ration shops mm -hmm. are still giving food only to the ration card holder. Uh, there is uh, some schemes a little bit skewed in place for migrant labor, but to actually connect the migrant labor with those, with that access, even an organization like ours is finding a huge problem because it's uh, they're scattered, they're all over the place, they're not just in buildings, they're in small sheds, they're in shanties, they're in buses. We don't have data, proper data on or mapping on where this uh, uh, migrant labor lives. So what should be the scheme in place for them? Okay, so I think this, uh, the first thing is to give greater importance to the well-being of poor people in public policy and to give more attention to their needs and their demands and their rights. Uh, you see, at the moment, I think the burden of the lockdown is being very unequally shared. The policies are basically being made by or under the influence of a class of people who are much more concerned about escaping the infection for themselves than about the well-being and rights of poorer people. So I think that's the first thing it's not just to enforce the lockdown in a top-down manner with a view to controlling the infection at all costs, but also to see the damage that is being done to people's livelihood and take action to uh, prevent further impoverishment and hunger. And there are a lot of things that can be done in that respect. In fact, there are a lot of used resources in the country at the moment that can be used to help poor people, uh, starting, of course, with enormous reserves of food grains, uh, well in excess of the official buffer norms. Uh, there are thousands of uh, unused vehicles that could be used to try and 
bring back some of those in a safe and dignified man manner. There are empty buildings like schools and colleges and stadiums that could be used to provide shelter to them in the meantime. Uh, and there are social security programs in place uh, like the pension schemes, the um, public distribution system, and even the Employment Guarantee Act that could be used much more actively to provide support to poor people. Unfortunately, the relief package that has been announced by the Finance Jean, your voice is dipping a bit. I think the network is slightly bad. Don't worry, if you could just speak a bit slower, maybe it will come across. Yeah, there's a lot of crackling at this end. Yeah, but, now uh, it's better. Now it's better. When you speak right a bit slower. Yeah, so sure. I, was, anyway, I was coming to a conclusion. So I was basically saying that the relief package announced by the finance minister a couple of weeks ago is only a fraction of what needs to be done to help vulnerable people. And in particular, I would say that there's an urgent need to release a much larger portion of the excess full grain stocks to expand and consolidate the public distribution system, maybe even to universalize it, at least in rural areas and urban slums, and provide at least minimum food security to everyone. Uh, for the first time we saw, after the sudden lockdown on March 24th, that the quote-unquote commercial media, uh, not all of it, but some of it started actually somehow carrying the narrative of 500,000 or 600,000 uh, workers with, with, their, with their little meager, uh, everything on their backs, walking hundreds of kilometers back to their villages in utter panic. It sort of showed the complete lack of faith in the state in one sense, uh, when this uh, population just started moving back to where it feels secure. Uh, we also had a few deaths on the way. We had a horrible death of a worker in Gurgaon a couple of days ago, uh, simply because he didn't have anything to feed his family with. Uh, uh, why is there not a more aggressive articulation of the needs of this vast section of the Indian people? Is it a crisis of politics? Is it a crisis of social movements? I mean, what is it? Because sh surely there should be a very articulate and aggressive uh, expression of the needs of so many Indians. Uh, yes, you see, I, I think the migrant worker population, of course, is one of the most uh, powerless and invisible in Indian society. And by the way, it is not the only vulnerable group right now. There are many other important groups like uh, casual laborers who are now in their homes, uh, people who don't have ration cards, uh, old people who always tend to be neglected within the family in a situation like this. So it's not just the migrant workers, but yes, the migrant workers, of course, are a very important uh, vulnerable group. It's all daily they, wage earners. It's all daily wage earners, really. Well, daily wage earners, I think, is uh, the biggest vulnerable category, whether they are migrant workers or whether they are in their homes. But I think that there are also people who can't even work, like uh, old people, widows who yeah. live without family support. So we have to really think about them as well. But let's leave them aside for now. Uh, coming back to your question, so I think one problem, of course, is that the migrant workers are virtually invisible most of the time. Uh, they travel by uh, uh, unreserved trains that uh, are not being used by the middle class. Uh, they are not uh, being... Uh, the subject of media stories. They are, of course, very exploited by the contractors who arrange for them to go to various places, and nobody is very keen to publicize their living conditions. I think what is interesting is that in spite of the publicity that they have finally received in the last few days, uh, still very little is being done for them, certainly not enough. And in particular, very little is being done to enable them to go back to their homes of course, it's not a very simple matter, but it seems to me that it would be better to enable them to start going back in a staggered and organized manner rather than to open the floodgates uh, later on when the, when the lockdown is relaxed. And in fact, uh, as you probably know, some students uh, yesterday or the day before were brought back from Kota to uh, Uttar Pradesh on special buses. So if that is being done for students, then why not, why not for migrant workers? 
And I suspect that a part at least of the answer is that some of the influential employers in the host states don't really want many of these people to go back because it's basically their source of cheap manpower. And they know that if these people go back, they are going to be very afraid of uh, migrating, by migrating again for quite a while. And so there may be uh, shortages of manpower in some of these states like Maharashtra, uh, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, and so on. So I think that is one possible reason why there's so much reluctance to help them to go back, even though from the point of view of health, surely it would be better to initiate a staggered and organized return than to let them live in these cramped conditions for a few more weeks and then open the floodgates. How should the burden of this lockdown be bared? Who should bear it? It leads us to this question so, because so uh, after all, to... all of Indian society is very structured, a very, very uh, uh, I mean, disparate. There's huge disparity, economic disparity, social disparity. Uh, and uh, I mean, who should actually bear the burden of this lockdown? Okay. So if we want the burden of the lockdown to be better shared, and I think that is very important to do, First of all, we have to give better support to vulnerable people. We have to use the food grain stocks to expand the public distribution system. We need much larger cash transfer programs. We need shelters for the migrants. We need community kitchens for people who have no other source of support. And all this can actually be done. And the other part is that uh, I think the, uh, to answer your question, uh, the uh, burden of paying for this could fall as much as possible on the rich and especially on the super rich and on the people who are relatively immune to this crisis. Uh, as you know, the wealth of the super rich in India has become absolutely obscene. I mean, even if you just talk of the top 100 richest families in India, just 100, sorry, I mean 1,000. The top 1,000 families between them uh, appear to have a wealth of around 50 lakh crores, that's, that's completely insane. So even if you tax a very small fraction of that, like, you know, three or four percent, uh, you could rake up as much as one percent of GDP, or you could do it every year for that matter. Uh, and one percent of GDP is more than the entire relief package announced by the finance minister. In fact, that relief package is worth barely one half of one percent of GDP, if you take into account the creative accounting and the window dressing. So large resources could be uh, mobilized relatively quickly by uh, increasing taxes on the rich and especially on super rich. It may take a little time to collect those taxes, but in the meantime, what you can do is you can borrow against the future tax proceeds of these wealth taxes or similar taxes like inheritance tax. So it's all very doable, but again, I think the main problem is not lack of feasibility, but the resistance of the privileged. Jean, in 2001, it was a POCL petition uh, that actually led step by step by step by step, finally, to something called a Food Security Act in this country. You know, uh, So given that background, uh, the question I'm asking is that have the two most powerful organs of Indian democracy, parliament and the courts, uh, sort of fail the people of India at this juncture? Because uh, you have, if you have a functioning democracy, you can't just have the executive functioning with whatever little critique you make of it and its policy. Uh, you have a separation of powers under the constitution. Uh, you're supposed to debate the policies put in place by parliament. Should there not have been an emergency session uh, where all uh, political voices could have spoken and uh, ex expressed their views, whichever way they felt, uh, regard uh, depending on uh, uh, what ideologies they represent and people they represent, so that not just this majoritarian view uh, came across. And our courts have seemed to just gone completely uh, with the will of the government and rather than questioning policies for vast sections of Indians? Yes. Well, I think you are basically right, Tisna. And uh, I'm glad that you brought up uh, what happened about 20 years ago when the right to food case started. 
because there was, there's a real sense of deja vu. Uh, indeed, the situation today is very similar to what was happening at that time when the food stocks were growing out of control. And on the other hand, they were the cause of starvation death from different parts of the country. Except that today, the situation is even more extreme. The food stocks are even larger, and they are growing even faster. And of course, much larger numbers are being threatened today with food insecurity. And it's you are right to point out that at that time, we were actually able to get a reasonably positive res uh, response from the Supreme Court when the petition was uh, filed by the People's Union for Civil Liberties, asking for these food stocks to be used to protect people from hunger. For example, the Supreme Court issued very quickly an order on uh, school meals, which to this day enables about 120 million children to get a free meal at school um, every day, at the school day at least. Okay, could you just, repeat that, that, uh, could you just uh, repeat that once again so we get it because of the audio? That the Supreme Court passed that order on children. Could you just repeat that so, part? Yeah. Yeah. So, so for instance, very quickly, yeah. the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court passed a, an, an order on uh, midday meals in primary schools, yeah. directing the state governments to organize cooked meals uh, for children at school. And to this day, uh, more than 120 million children, uh, school children, benefit from cooked meals at school because of that uh, Supreme Court order. And then later on, of course, there were other initiatives, uh, there were uh, increases in coverage and amounts of pensions. There was the Employment Guarantee Act, and of course, later on, the National Food Security Act. Not all as an outcome of that court case, but as an outcome of the activism that built around it. Okay. But today, we have a very different situation where, as you say, uh, there's a certain amount of apathy towards the speech. Issues. Uh, the central government is doing much less than it should be doing. Many of the state governments do varies a lot. Uh, many of the state governments are also not doing much. And as you pointed out, the court is not really taking much of a stand on it. Uh, this is part of a larger pattern of uh, the Supreme Court being very hesitant in the recent past to stand up to the central government, uh, whether it is in the context of uh, Article 370 or the Ram Janandini issue or the CA, NPRs, and so forth. Uh, that in turn, I think, is part of a more general pattern at this time of all kinds of institutions, uh, whether it's the courts, uh, the media, even the political opposition, caving in to the government and hesitating to stand up to it. And that I think is very worrying. In a way, it's more worrying. And the fact that the government itself is trying to restrict uh, democratic rights and civil liberties. Because as long as people stand up for these rights, there is still some hope. But today we find that a relatively small number of people, of course, there are, there are some, and there are some, including you, uh, who are doing it at great personal risk. But we need a much larger number of people uh, to stand up for democratic rights and to express their commitment constitutional values. I think that is the only hope of reversing the current trend uh, towards restriction of democracy and reviving uh, the spirit of the constitution. It's been a fascinating conversation, Jean, and I wanted to ask you one last question. You're in Rachi at the moment, uh, and yes. uh, you also expressed the concern that what will be the impact of reverse migration in states like Bihar, Jharkhand, Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, as and when it happens, because it's going to happen at some point. And that is also going to have an impact, both societal and economic. And uh, right. you know, are we prepared for it? Are governments preparing for it? Are societies preparing for it? Yes. Particularly given the kind of hate letting uh, around this whole COVID-19 pandemic, where certain yes. groups are being targeted very viciously. Right. So, uh, Tista, I think one needs to give much greater attention and priority in this situation to the poorer states, including Jharkhand, Bihar, even more, uh, West Bengal, Orissa, Chhattisgarh, Uttar Pradesh. Not just because those are the poorer states, but because they're going to be hit hardest by this crisis. Because as you said, 
the migrant workers are going to return sooner or later. And then what is going to happen is that there's going to be a situation of enormous excess labor in those states. They have a huge class of underemployed workers at the best of times. And the main lifeline for these families is uh, migration, labor migration. But now, as I mentioned earlier, for quite a while, most of them are likely to be afraid to migrate again because they know that they may be localized, if not a national lockdown at their response in the near future. So they are probably going to prefer, as far as possible, to, be, to stay with their families. And then they're going to look for whatever work they find uh, in the area. Some of them may find a little bit of work in construction or in uh, dhabas or something. And the rest will go for survival activities like pulling a rickshaw or bringing some wood for, from the forest and selling it at whatever price they can. So what you will see is that the earnings in these survival activities, because of the enormous excess supply of labor, are going to decline. Uh, so the situation is going to be very, very difficult, especially in states like Bihar that, that have a huge class of landless casual laborers who live on the brink of uh, starvation at the best of times. And that is why, once again, uh, we have to come to terms with the fact that these families are going to depend primarily on government support and social security programs for quite a while, and why we need to do much more to consolidate these social security programs. What stops if governments from opening up the Food Corporation of India reserves? And what good question? What, I think and is cash transfer an answer? Yeah, so I think about the food stocks, that's really a question that you should ask uh, somebody in the central government uh, or the food ministry. Why, why, when you have so much excess stocks and you're actually wasting money on storage and also when the monsoon comes, some of the, when the monsoon comes, some of these excess stocks are bound to start rotting. Why aren't you releasing more of the food? So I think part of the problem, which I had written about earlier, is the fact that the food subsidy gets counted at the point of release of the stocks. So oddly enough, when you release stocks, which is more or less costless in economic terms, it actually costs money to the central government in pure accounting terms. So it's just an accounting anomaly which makes it expensive to release the stocks. I think that at this time, there's also another problem. I'll try to explain it briefly. But basically, there's a kind of chicken game going on between the state governments and the central government. Okay. A chicken game in economics is a kind of situation where there's a bargaining between two parties and it's a question of who is going to blink first. For example, uh, you all know about the situation where you're trying to hire, uh, let's say, a rickshaw or a tempo and the tempo is asking for 100 rupees and you say, no, 50 rupees. And then it's a question of who caves in first. Uh, and sometimes what happens is, is that nobody caves in because you are hoping that the other person will blink. And then the tempo just drives away or you walk away. And both parties are worse off because the tempo would actually have preferred to take you for 50 rupees. And you would have actually preferred to pay 100 rupees to go in the tempo. But the bargain broke down. So there's something like that going on right now because the center is saying to the states, you pay 21 rupees a kilo or we don't give you two stocks. And the states are saying, no, we want the food stocks for free. And they, they are both trying to uh, dig their heels so that the other party caves in. And the result, the result as, at least until now, is that none of the two sides are blinking. And so the food grain stocks remain where they are. Now, let me just complete the argument by mentioning that, in my view, it is the central government that should make a compromise and agree to give the food stocks for free. Because the food stocks are costless, why should the central government charge the state governments, which are short of cash, for these excess food stocks? There's no logic to it. All the more so because the central government has been shortchanging the states for many years by calculating the coverage of the PDS, the public distribution system, by using the 2011 population the bottom line is very simple. The bottom line is that the central government is being, being very stingy, and very obtuse, and very irrational in refusing to release more of the food grain stocks for free to the state governments. 
Uh, could you also just repeat the point about using 2000 projected 2020 2020 figures rather than 2011 figures because that's i think very important okay. when it so comes the to point I was making the point i was making is this under the national food security act two thirds of the population has to be covered under the public distribution system now the central government is using the 2011 census population to calculate the mandatory coverage so two thirds of 1200 million 1200 million was the population of India is 2011, that's 800 million. So the, the coverage of the PDS today is around 800 million. Now, if you were to take two thirds of today's population, it would be more than 900 million. Exactly. So more than 100 million people would be, would be covered. That is what I mean when I say that the central government is shortchanging the states. Now, of course, it's also important to remember that not only are these 100 million not covered, but then there's also the one third that the act doesn't cover those are also outside the PDS. So the bottom line is that a large number of people today and a large number of poor people don't have a ration card and it's very important to do something for them because they've lost their livelihood and many of them are going to be exposed to hunger and starvation in the next few months or even the next few weeks. And that is one argument for universalizing the PDS at the very least in rural areas and urban slums, and as I said, it will require releasing only about half, in fact, less than half of the excess food stocks to do that for an entire year. So it's very doable. What are the stocks at present? Okay, so in March it was uh, 77 million tons, according to the uh, FCI, and it is going to it is going to grow I further think. in the next few weeks because of rabi procurement. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it could go to 80, 90 million tons in, by the beginning of July, which is unprecedented. The food stocks have never reached such high levels and the food, uh, the uh, storage capacity of the FCI is not sufficient to ensure safe storage of such huge amounts of food. Therefore, it would be much better, obviously, even from a pure economic point of view, to release them and distribute them to poor people. Finally, just a couple of words on cash transfers before we end this fascinating conversation. All right. So cash transfers are also very important. Uh, we are talking largely about food assistance right now because the food stocks are so huge and also because the food assistance is going to be the first line of defense. The PDS is in place, it's working not perfectly, but it's working sufficiently well that it can, it can act as the main source of food security for a large majority of the population immediately. Now, of course, on top of that, you have to do cash transfers because people have many other basic needs uh, other than food. For example, uh, some people who need medicine urgently need cash at this time to buy their medicines. All kinds of things that require cash. Now, the government has initiated some cash transfers for relief purposes. The main one is the transfer of 500 rupees per month to women's uh, PMGDY accounts, Jandan Yojana accounts. Uh, but obviously, that is too little. 500 rupees a month is not enough to yeah. even cover the most basic necessities. It could be easily increased. And then, uh, of course, not everyone has a JDY account. In fact, according to a recent study by Rohini Pandey and others, only about half of poor women have a so obviously it's not to cover half of the poor households. And then there's going to be a big problem of disbursement of the cash. Because many people in rural India still live in places that are very poorly served by the banks. And there's a risk now that once the lockdown is relaxed or open, huge numbers of people are going to rush to the banks to look for cash. In fact, you can already see long queues outside the banks in many areas, even in some of the urban areas. But that is going to increase a lot after the lockdown is uh, opened or relaxed. Now, in principle, uh, what is called business correspondence, the uh, extension companies, if you like, the banks, the villages, could help to decongest the banks, and we are doing it to some extent at the moment. But the problem is that they all use biometric authentication, or rather fingerprint authentication for this purpose. And uh, 
from what I understand from them, there is no alternative technology that they could use to render the same service. Now it's very surprising if you think of it, that they are still allowed to use biometric recognition because one of the first uh, measures that was taken by the central government on the 6th of March, at the very beginning, when it was beginning to wake to the whole crisis, one of the first measures taken by the central government was to discontinue uh, biometric attendance for government employees on the grounds that it is not safe because it can contribute to transmit, transmit the virus. But why, if it is not safe for government employees, then why is it supposed to be safe for poor people who are trying to get small amounts of cash from the business correspondent? So ideally, they should not be allowed and they should be replaced by more effective uh, payment systems that are also safe. The problem is that nobody seems to be giving much thought to that right now. And if the business correspondence has continued without better payment systems being put in place or without, at the very least, reinforcing the staff at the banks, which is not a way of dealing with the problem, but if nothing is done and the VCs are discontinued overnight, then a lot of people are going to face even more inconvenience than they are facing today to get their cash. So, in short, we are going to see poor people facing huge inconvenience and hardship uh, to get their cash and sometimes even to find out whether they have received cash. Because don't forget that only half of adult women in a JDY account, but most of them don't know whether their bank account is a JDY account or not. So many of them are going to go to the bank, queue for long hours, maybe they will be told to come back the next day, all that just to find out whether any money has been sent to their account, and many of them will be told, no, there is no money, either because their account is not a JDY account, or because it's a JDY account, a JDY account but there have been uh, some of the uh, numerous technical glitches that tend to affect these bank transfers nowadays. So we are basically facing a huge, huge crisis and there's not enough empathy, uh, innovation and... Uh, uh, and resources. Sorry? And resources. And resources. resources. Being, uh, no, the resources are there, but they're not being used. The resources are there, but they're not that's used. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's so somehow correct. we need to raise our voices even more strongly that there's greater innovation, more immediacy and an opening up of already existent resources. And uh, I think your voice is one of the most important voices. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having joined us this morning. I know you went through a lot of inconvenience coming out to a place where there's better connectivity at very short notice. We'll keep coming back to you, Jean, for conversations because thank I think you. it's important uh, to hear. Uh, thank you so, so much uh, for your time. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. And for the work that you do. Yeah, and for the work that you do. Bye.